Hey guys, King Kath here, and welcome to my Creation Kit 101 video. Now, before we go into this, I just want to re recommend you uh, watch my intro video if you didn't already. If you don't have time for that and you just want to get to it, uh, so be it, but I'll give a quick few notes about it. The overall goal of this series is to take all of the knowledge I've gained over the years modding Fallout 4 and dump it into video format so that all the little tricks and stuff I've learned are not lost and also to give people who want to mod a step-by-step -step guide to get there. I've always felt that was the most difficult part of getting into modding any new game was that there was never a guide to get me from point A to point Z. I didn't know, I would have an idea, say I wanted to build a weapon mod or I wanted to build a systems mod. I wouldn't even know where to begin or the steps I should do to get there. So I wouldn't even know where to start learning. So my hope is I can provide that for those of you looking to mod Fallout 4. And I think based on my experience also modding some of the older games is that the information will not will carry backwards so some of this information i teach you will be useful if you want to go mod skyrim or something like that and most of the information should always also carry forward so hence the name of the series being bethesda mod school presumably even though i'm teaching from the perspective of fallout 4 you should be able to use this information in other games there will be some things that won't overlap and you can learn from other people in those communities on how to deal with that but you can at least get started and have a game here with Fallout 4 to practice on and uh, slowly start to take an idea and bring it to life. So, with all that out of the way, uh, the Creation Kit 101, my goal here is to teach you the real basics. So I want you to understand what the software is you're looking at and how to get it installed, things like that. So we'll start out with the installer. Uh, essentially, you're going to want to open the Bethesda.net launcher. And you're going to click on the upper left-hand corner. There's a little arrow that will allow you to see more of Bethesda's games because on the far left, it's just going to list their most current games. And you choose Creation Kit on the 4 Fallout 4 uh, out of the list there. Now, this does require that you have Fallout 4 installed on PC. So if you're an Xbox player hoping to mod, you will need to buy a copy of Fallout 4 on PC. Should be pretty cheap out there on Steam or some other site. Uh, maybe GOG has it. I'm not sure where else you can get it. But should be pretty cheap by now. The game did come out in 2015. It's now currently 2019. So I'm hoping that you should be able to find a 20 or $30 copy pretty easily. So once you've installed the mod or once or rather the creation kit, and by the way, during the installation, the easiest way to keep everything working is just install it into your Fallout 4 directory. So it should default to finding your Fallout 4 install in Steam. Let it go there. It may seem messy, but it just makes it will make your life infinitely easier if you just do that. So then after it finishes installing, it's going to pop up the creation kit. And the first thing you're going to be asked is, do you want to extract the scripts? You're going to want to say yes to this and just use the default location. Even if you have no interest in scripting, scripting or you're not a programmer, you're still going to have to do some amount of rudimentary scripting to mod. Don't worry. Most of it is super, super easy. It's one or two lines for some of the stuff you'll have to do. And I'll show you lots of examples. And even though I'm not actively looking to teach someone to program, I'll probably eventually end up with a lot of papyrus tutorials, either in this video series or in supplementary materials on my forums or in PDFs or something like that. I haven't laid out exactly how this is all going to go, but we already have tons of resources available on the simsettlements.com forums to help people with modding, not to mention all of the toolkits I've done for Sim Settlements. So in, eventually you will learn a lot of scripting and you're going to need access to those source files for all of the scripts that Bethesda wrote. So just go ahead and extract those. All right, so the first thing that's going to happen, you're going to roll into the creation kit, and it's kind of intimidating because it doesn't look like you anything you'd expect. It's not like if uh, uh, I've been modding uh, games for a long time, and I remember one of the easiest experiences I had was loading up into a Blizzard map editor because it would start out with a map, and you would have a, t a palette with the different items you could build, and you could just drag and color onto this map, and it was real easy to understand and get into. Well, with creation kit, it's not quite that uh, user friendly up front. So I'm gonna just show you some of the basics here and we'll keep building on this knowledge over time, but there's a few things that you really need to know in order to even start using the creation kit. So that's what I wanna teach you in this video. I'm gonna show you how to load up files, how to save them, how to find your old files, etc., And then I'll teach you how to do some basic edits to the game so that you can go ahead and start playing around. And then in the next episode, I'll give you something with a little more structure. So the first thing you'll do whenever you load up the creation kit is go to the file menu and click data. And what this will do is bring up a list of all of your plugins. Now, a plugin file is a mod, essentially. And as you can see, the first one there, Fallout 4.esm, 
it's a plugin. So the base game is actually loaded just like a mod is. Same with all of the DLC and then any of the Creation Club content, etc. Don't mind all the massive, massive files I have. I have like eight copies of Sim Settlements because of all the different tweaks we try out. I like to do them in edited versions of it just to make sure that I'm not messing with our master file. But anyway, what the first thing you're going to do here is double click Fallout 4.esm. Now, we're going to come back into the screen lots of times, and I'll show you some other things. But for now, just to get started, just know that this isn't the step you're going to have to repeat this exact step of loading Fallout4.esm. In fact, generally, the only time you have to do this in particular is when you're starting a brand new mod. So we're going to hit OK after you double-click that, and it should have the X there. So note that it's a uh, single-click doesn't do anything. It is a double-click. And then press OK. Now, give this a minute. This, is, this can take a while to load, and this is one of the things that you will slowly will slowly drive you mad with the creation kit is that the load time is such that when the when the creation kit crashes which i'm sure any of you have considered modding or have listened to modders talk know the creation kit is uh, prone to do that on occasion and i can show i'll show you points where it is most likely to crash so that before you try and do those things you can make sure you save i'm also going to quickly show you where an auto save feature so that's built into the creation kit so that you can take advantage of that there's just a lot of things that you can do to protect yourself over time so that you don't get to that infuriated uh, frustrating point where you kind of rage quit modding all right so after several minutes <laughs> you should be loaded up and so this is a great thing to launch and load your plugin and then, you know, go, go grab a coffee or go to the bathroom, do whatever you got to do. Cause this is going to, this is that load time will only get worse as you build more complex mods. It's unfortunate, but this is one of the, one of the reasons that the F04 edit program is so popular. And I'll eventually cover some of that because there are certain things you can only do in the third party tools for editing mods. Those are, that's called Tez edit. That's cause it was originally designed for the elder scrolls, but it it's also works for, fallout the fallout games and it's called fo4 edit when used with fallout 4 again we'll cover that in another uh another tutorial but know that if the creation kit drives you insane you can do most things in the third party tools and they're much much faster but they're also much less graphical friendly they're not uh, they're kind of like the equivalent of uh, operating in in dos compared to windows not quite that extreme but it's definitely a lot more user friendly to be in the creation kit at least in my in my experience and estimation all right, so once you're loaded in here, you guys are probably going to see one screen different that I do not have on my screen, and that's because I, I take care of it in a certain way. So you probably have a warning pop up on your screen, and you and you might have already closed it, um, and that instinct was incorrect. So the warning pop up in there, some people find it useful, and I'm sure there are some people who will comment here or mod authors who find it useful and will tell you reasons why you should keep it. I find it to be completely useless and actually more of a nuisance. So. What you can do with any of these windows in here is you can close them, but the warning window will continue to pop up every time you do something that the creation kit doesn't like. And sometimes the warnings come up for things that are very, very innocuous. So you're going to want to just shrink it. So what you'll do with it. So I don't have the warning window, so I'm showing you with the layers window, but do this exact same thing with the warning window. Just grab a corner and shrink it down till all you can see is its title and X and then just drag it off to the side way out of your field of view and just leave it there. And then whenever those warnings come up, they will be down there shrunk out of your way. So you don't have to deal with them because throughout your work through the creation kit, you will get warnings occasionally. Uh, again, I find them very useless because you can clean all of that sort of thing up. Anything that would come up as a problem, that's an actual problem. When we get to the tutorial where we talk about cleaning your mods with FO4 edit, that's that third party tool I keep mentioning it will help you handle most of those types of errors. There are probably a few, and like I said, somebody will comment with those, and if somebody has some really useful stuff you can do with the warning window, I'd love to learn about that. One of the things to know about this tutorial series, I do not know everything. I will learn things along with you sometimes, and some of the things I've learned or think I know, I might not be doing in the most optimal way. So this is gonna be a growing thing for me as well. So if you are one of those people you know better than I do on something I show you, absolutely comment below or reach me in some other way you know how, and give me the better way to do it, so that I can then go go redo the tutorial and teach everybody else how to do it uh, a more proper way. So keep an eye out for that for if I ever release uh, repeat videos or, or new release videos. I will try and take these old ones and relink them to more updated information if somebody teaches me something important that I should have taught all of you. So definitely follow, through, follow up on this series. It will continue to uh, grow and evolve within itself as well. All right, so now that you've got that warning window out of the way, let's talk about the screens you do see right in front of you. So the first and most common window you will work in is the object window. And the object window is essentially a series of 
all the things that make up the game. So by default right now, we have just the Fallout 4 stuff loaded. Now, I'm going to try and avoid too many technical things right in this first video because I don't want to overwhelm you. But essentially, each record in here, so and the records are, okay, let's, let's start this a little sooner. So on the left here, these are your categories. On the right are your records. Now, the records are actually called forms often, and this is relevant, especially when we get into scripting way later. But just know that if I refer to a form or a record, I'm talking about the same thing. And essentially, it's anything in the game. So for example, this is, right now we are selected on the quest category, which is under the category, the character category. Uh, so you'll notice some of these quests if I were to, uh, let me see if I can find one that you would recognize. So if we go to like BOS, M00, and if we go to the quest data tab, uh, that's the miscellaneous, that's not a great one. Let's see, I want to find one where you'll recognize the name. So the Lost Patrol. So you probably recognize that from in the game. Uh, we'll cover quests in time. Those are a very complex thing. Um, and now the this one right here, just while we're on the topic, that it's it has a quest name that you would never see in game. Quests aren't just quests like you would do in the game where you have, you know, objectives and you complete them and you gain experience. Quests are also considered kind of control objects. They're, they're, they can do cool stuff in the background. And again, we'll cover all that in later, so don't worry about it too much. I just wanted to explain why that one had a weird name. So effectively, on the left here are all the categories of the different types of things, and the records and forms can be anything. They can be a spell, which in Fallout 4, a spell is talking about, say, a the, the way a weapon affects something might be considered a spell. Radiation damage is kind of a spell. Potions are actually things like food and water. And all of this is based on the fact that this was built on an Elder Scrolls core. So the idea of everything was kind of rooted in fantasy as opposed to sci-fi. So some of the terms in here are going to be more, so for example, magic. Uh, and we'll, we'll go over that and explain to you how those things work. But feel free to poke around in here and uh, click on these different categories and you'll see all the different things that make up the game. Then on the right, the list of forms, you can double click on any one of these to get information about them. Not only can you get information about them, but you can also edit any of these. Now, I will say, in general, never release a mod where you've edited these things. You should always try your damnedest to find another way. But while you're learning, go edit the crap out of these. This is a great way to find out how different records affect the game. It's a great way to get quick mods done. You can just, by editing things in here, you can change the whole feel of the game. Um, so I would absolutely say while you're experimenting and playing around, go ahead and edit to your heart's content. Just grab random things, go, go to the ammo and just play with the different things, change the numbers, go in game and see what happens and just play around. Uh, that's definitely a great way to get started. And for building mods for yourself, it's perfect because you're not going to piss anybody off. But in general, you're, you're going to want to go in with the idea in long term. If you're planning on making mods to release, you should never, ever edit these things. And there are exceptions. Obviously, there are some ways you can't get around that. For example, if you're building some sort of overhaul mod, then you're going to be editing things. Uh, there are some things that we'll talk about where there's absolutely no way to do them other than edit vanilla uh, records. And vanilla is a, is a term you'll frequently hear me refer to. And all that's talking about is the the former record in the way it existed in the base game or in the DLC. So basically the way that Bethesda presented it to us, that's considered vanilla. Once it's modded, it's no longer vanilla. So I say don't ever edit vanilla records. And the reason for that is that the way modding works, and some most of you probably already know this, is that the last mod in a list that, or the, the let's say for example, you have three mods that all edit ammo five millimeter. Only the last one in your load order that edited it will actually have its effects take place. Now there are exceptions to those rules and there are things we can talk about and there's merge patches and there's all sorts of complicated stuff like that. But in general, if you wanna make your life easier as a modder by avoiding editing actual vanilla records, you won't have to deal with having to create patches or compatibility things for other mods and it will just make your life a lot happier. So in general, you're gonna to want to go with the goal of never editing vanilla things. I'll show you lots of ways you can do that. But while you're learning and playing, go ahead. Go ahead and start editing things. Just start grabbing grabbing random things that interest you. Pop them open by double-clicking them and uh, edit away. All right, so that's the object window. This is where you'll do most of your playing. Next below that, we've got the cell view. Now, this is where I, I talked earlier about the idea of the Warcraft editor because that was one of the first editors I ever got into uh, back, in the, back in the day playing... RTS games, and if you want to do something more like that in the sense of having something visual to play around with, this is where you'd go. So the cell view will is the first part and the render, vind render window is the other part. 
So the first thing here is at the top left, you've got world space and it lists all of the different world spaces that are built into the game. This is also where if you ever created your own custom world space, which we're not going to go into today, but we'll probably talk about eventually. Um, this is where you would change between the different, uh, this is where you'd find your custom world space. So uh, interiors are going to be all of the cells that you teleport into. So you can read through this list and you can, and I'm sure you can imagine where you've seen these in the game. Uh, and then Commonwealth are going to be most of the outdoor area within the base game. Diamond City is its own separate cell, and that's to keep the load screen from – so you don't have to load in everywhere and that it can uh, – actually, well, there, is, there are load screens within Diamond City. So the, the reason for keeping some of these bigger areas their own world spaces is that you can do then more in that area, out in that open outdoor area, without overloading people's uh, FPS, especially – for, since Bethesda tries to support Xbox and PS4 as well, they need to separate out some of those bigger areas into their own world spaces. And you'll find uh, that there are similar things in some of the DLC. Like I believe Nuka World has its market separated out into its own world space. But the, the world spaces in general, you're going to be mostly working with the interiors and probably the Commonwealth. And I mean, I guess if you're doing some sort of Diamond City or Good Neighbor edits or overhauls, you might pop into those. Sanctuary Hills World is the pre-war area. And then I am uncertain what Diamond City FX is. I've never actually played around in there. We, we might do that as part of this tutorial, go explore it, or I might do it as a, as a live stream one day just to talk about. And then Recent Cells is useful if you are working on a mod that touches a lot of places, that all of those will then just be grouped up in one spot so that you can find them. So then what ha So uh, in general, you'll start out in interiors because these are the quickest ones to load. So this is where I would recommend you start playing around, when, is just pick a random cell. So we're going to open up the Beantown Brewery here. And uh, note that while you're editing things in here, you're not actually editing the base game. What you're doing is you're slowly building up your own mod file. And we'll, we'll show you that in a second. We'll actually save it and uh, reload it, and I can show you how those changes work. But while you're playing around in here, when you have only the Fallout 4 ESM loaded, you're not actually making any tweaks that could affect your own mod. So this is totally safe to play around, and you don't have to worry about accidentally breaking anything. Now, in the future, once you have your actual mod loaded, which, again, I'll show you before we end this video, then when you're playing around in here, if it's a mod that you've already released or a mod that you intend on releasing, you should be very careful about what you touch because you can introduce those vanilla edits I was talking about. So vanilla edits can happen in two forms, either in popping open these different forms and just tweaking any of this stuff. So whether it be, you know, editing these values and changing them to different things or changing the names of things. Um, but they can also appear by being in this window, which, uh, which you just saw, and maybe I didn't say it, but you double click on any of these cell names to bring open the cell. And I'll, I'll show you how to navigate the camera and everything in just a second. But anything you touch in here can essentially become an edit. So you can cause an edit that would affect people's games. And while you're experimenting, great. It's, it's an awesome way to quickly figure stuff out. So let's start by showing you how you navigate around this window. So the first thing you'll want to know is how to manipulate the camera. So there's a few things you can do here. One is you can hold your middle mouse button and drag around. And you will just kind of drag the camera around. And if it ever freezes up like it's doing for me right now, that's just your game. The, the creation kit is loading more assets. So you got to kind of just pause and give it a little bit more time. You can also use the mouse wheel by rolling in and out to zoom. You can hold down the alt key. And let's see here. I'm going to, it's been so long. Oh, I'm sorry. Shift key. Hold down the shift key. It's been so long since I've said, told someone how to do this. Hold down the shift key. And then just move your mouse and you will rotate the camera around whatever you're selected on. And selecting things is done exactly how you'd, how you'd expect. You left click on them. Now occasionally, and I'm going to find an area where it'll happen, you'll try and left click on something. For example, I'm trying to click on that big thing I just had selected and you won't grab it. Instead, you'll grab seemingly nothing. So here's where a useful tip can come in with the cell view window. So on the cell view, the, the left side are the list of the... Uh, the cells that you're looking at, that you can look at and you can see the one I have selected is the one I'm in right now and on the right side is our ways to help you navigate your way around here and figure out what's going on so I'm going to uncheck all of these boxes to make sure that there's none checked and then I'm going to just check in selected only and then this will show me what I actually clicked on so often there are things that have very large bounding boxes and a bounding box is just kind of the invisible box by which you can click on things to select them 
So there are a lot of these things called mist. They're called mist of some sort, and essentially they they give the appearance of dust in the air in the game, and Bethesda likes to use them heavily. And when you are playing around in cells, you'll often find you're clicking on those instead. So having this set to selected only is great when you're trying to find your way around here. And then the, what you can do is push the number one key on your keyboard twice. And when that thing, and there are two things to note. One, one is that you have to have this window activated for that to do anything, and you have to have something selected. And when you do that, and you push one twice, you'll see that it disappears. So the first time it will fade away, the second time it disappears. And then to bring everything back that you hid, you press Alt plus the one key again, and that will unhide everything. So uh, what I tend to do is just start anything I click on that wasn't the thing I was aiming for. I just hide it real quick to get access to the thing I want. Now, once you have something selected, it will kind of get this green shade to it. And then you have a few different ways you can manipulate it. So one, you can just kind of drag it around and it will often drag the way you would think it will. But if you're having trouble with getting it to drag the exact way you want, there are a few things to note. One is that by default, snap to grid is turned on and that's up in the top left up here. The first the red circle with the grid and then right next to that is snap is snap to angle and those are those are great when you're building levels because a lot of the kit that bethesda has designed uh, are designed to snap together at certain increments so i'm going to show you an example of that so we're going to look at these wall pieces over here each of these walls is a particular size and when i drag it to the left and right you can see that they snap in nicely so that there are no gaps and so that it's very useful especially when building the structure of a level to actually keep snapping turned on but when you're trying to get to fine tune tune things or you're moving things that don't need to snap together such as debris or anything it's useful to turn that off and you can do that by just clicking on that or pressing the letter q on your keyboard and then that will unhighlight and then you can drag things a little slower so if you're if you need to move things in a different axis so right now i'm kind of moving things along the ground if i wanted to move things up and down there's a few things you could do one you could hold the z key and if you're not familiar with x y and z in 3d space essentially it's Z is a generally up and down. X and Y means forward and backward, left and right. Um, it would it would tend to follow. I believe it's X is always the X axis is generally left right, but because of the way your camera can move, that always is a matter of uh, that's always a matter of perspective. So instead instead of looking at it of worrying about which is X and which is Y, I tend to just look at it that everything will move along the the plane that it's on so it'll kind of move along the ground you're looking at if you drag it normally uh, unless you move up and down on the z axis and you can do that by holding the z key alternatively you can push the x or the e key the letter e and this will bring up this little guy where you can drag things in specific directions so this is great if you have something perfectly aligned in one way you want it but you need to nudge it in one different direction you can just highlight over the arrow you want till it turns yellow and then you'll know that any movement you do with your mouse will only move it along that axis, which is very, very useful. All right, so then the other thing you might want to do in here are to scale or rotate objects. So we'll start with scale because that's nice and easy. If you hold down the S key and just drag your left mouse button while something's highlighted, you will change the scale of it. And then for rotation, you have a couple of ways you can do it. The easiest rotation and the most common rotation you need is to rotate around itself. So around that Z axis. So uh, to see what I mean, so see how this thing's got that arrow pointing up in the center there, you're rotating around that. So that would be around like this. And now I was able to do that by just holding the right mouse button and dragging. And if you need to rotate on other axes, excuse me, you can push the W key on your keyboard and it will bring up these rings. And sometimes they're hard to see and you might need to move your camera while that's up and to figure out which one. And then you can just highlight those until they're yellow and it will allow you to move on different axes. Now, right there, I anticipated that thing going to my left and right but instead it's going forward and backward and then that's a matter of one of those camera trickery things or it can also be that the the orientation of this thing is different than i expect so if it doesn't work the way you'd expect you can just hit Control z which is undo uh, a lot of the hotkeys you would expect to work in any program will work in this so Control z to undo things does work here and uh, instead you just try one of the other ones so then i can see that this is actually the ring that lets me rotate in that direction so bringing up, pressing W brings up this ring thing that you can play around with. And if you don't like any of these hotkeys, they can all be edited, and we might cover that in a future video. But uh, it's for your reference, it's under Edit, Render Window, Hotkeys, and you can change some of these keys. And you can also use it to search for keys. So it's a very useful tool if you want to know hotkeys on how to do things. So uh, recap, in general, what you're going to be doing is clicking on things and then holding the Shift key to rotate your camera around them. 
Use the mouse wheel to zoom in and out. Use the middle mouse button to move your camera around. And that should cover most of your movement. And then uh, again, we had one, which will hide things, and then Alt-1 to unhide them. Now, if you want to get rid of an item, you can select it and push the Delete key on your keyboard, and that will remove it. One thing that's really important to note is when you're deleting things, make sure you never do it while this cell window is highlighted. So like if I were to go and hit delete while this is highlighted, what this is actually having me do is delete that record for that particular object in the whole creation kit. So that would make it so that that thing could never be built again. You definitely don't ever want to do that. I don't even know why that that's a function. That seems to me like it's some sort of oversight or bug uh, or that they just didn't think about people ever doing that because it's really dangerous to do. So make sure whenever you press that delete key, Key, you have this highlighted unless your goal is to actually delete one of these forms here but generally that wouldn't be a vanilla form that would be something in your mod and we'll cover that later I'm sure we'll we'll make a mistake at some point and I'll have to delete something and you'll see me do that so that uh, so that covers all the movement editing and camera movement you would do in here as well as deleting so now the next thing you're wondering is probably how do you add things so let's start with adding the thing most common uh, that's uh, fun to add, which would be more enemies to fight. So we go under, and the, the, all these different categories we will cover eventually, and uh, you'll learn all of them, but uh, I'm going to just start here with actor. So this is your NPCs. Now, one thing we didn't cover in the object window that's incredibly useful is this filter box. So here you can type in any words or letters to get uh, just those items that match that in their ID. And you can also use asterisks in there to act as wildcards. So if you only know part of the name, for example, all actors that are part of leveled lists. So that means that they're going to be actors that will match your player level or get close to it so that they're actually a challenge. We'll start with the, the term LVL in there. And some of them will have LVL after something. For example, the, uh, the, the DN things have to do with, site, with specific quests. And we'll, again, we'll cover all that stuff later. But if I scroll down here to the LVL, let's say I wanted, um, I wanted some sort of Minuteman you could type in and I don't, but I'm not sure if they call them, how they, how they name them in here. I could do something like LVL star minute, and then that would likely bring up all of the Minutemen records that uh, are leveled characters. So then we can just drop in any of these we want and you just literally drag them from this object window onto a point in this window. And sometimes they'll end up somewhere really weird, like right up in your camera. And what that tends to mean is that there was something there in your camera that was that you didn't know. Cause it, what it tries to do is attach when you drag and drop it, it, it tries to attach the thing to whatever your mouse drops on. So when sometimes when this happens where it gets right up in your face, uh, you just need to zoom out a little bit and then just move it to where you want it. So we're going to bring up this E thing and we're going to drag it down to the ground. And then this is where you got to manipulate your camera and kind of zoom in and make sure that it's set in a nice way. Uh, one little trick here with certain things is when you're close, once you've got something close to the ground, and I'll say only use this when you're close to the ground or you can cause the CK to kind of lock up if you're too far away, uh, is once you get it pretty close, if you push the F key, and then give it a moment, it will align that thing to the ground. And it can't always do it, it doesn't work every time. So if you find that nothing's happening, but you're still able to move your camera, it, then it's not gonna do anything and you can ignore it. But often, and let me find an exact example. So we're gonna go down to uh, ammo. We're gonna go ahead and just drop some ammo in. So we'll type in my favorite ammo, which is shotgun. And if we got ammo shotgun shell, we drag this in. Oh, and you know what, With am ammo is a tricky one. And it was a terrible example to show you uh, because with ammo, you actually want to drop in, not the ammo itself. You want to drop in uh, something else. But my my shotgun shell did come in here. We'll cover what you'd want to drop with, uh, with ammo later, but it will drop one, but it's literally just going to be a single shell, which isn't particularly useful. But anyway, if I uh, drag this over, get a little closer to the ground, and then I push that F key, if I get it closer to the ground, let's see here. So this is, this is probably going to be the thing that takes you the longest to learn if you're trying to do any 3D editing in the world space is learning to manipulate your camera. Another trick that's really useful is pushing the T key, which will line you up to the top of the item. Now, one thing to note, if you immediately start rotating your, your camera from that point, it won't rotate you how you might think it would. Instead, what you want to do is click on that thing again before you start rotating your camera, and then it will rotate exactly how you'd expect. So often what's happening if the F key isn't working like it isn't for me right now, it usually has to do with those bounding boxes. So there'll be certain items around whose bounding boxes are preventing this from detecting where the ground is. And there are way things we can do about that. I'll cover those in another video because I'm sure I'm overwhelming you all already with all this information. But 
the F key is generally a little trick. It's not working for me now and it might not be working for you or it might be working for you. Uh, but I tend to do things all manually anyway because I, I find the, the F key to be so unreliable even though it is designed to save you time. And in certain spaces, especially if you're working in your own custom world space, it, it does work pretty well. But it's just in these busy spaces with all this going on that they tend to get it tends to get wonky. But you'll basically just align things up to the ground. So we, now we've got an extra shotgun shell we've placed. We've placed this random Minuteman. And uh, you just drag things into the window and just position them. And that's it. That's, that's how they exist. And then if I want to delete them, again, just like I deleted that random pipe, I can select this thing and push delete. Now, the last window we'll talk about in this particular video is one of my personal favorite windows, and that is the Layers tab. And I highly recommend you get used to this. If you are a Photoshop user or any you know use any type of uh, creative software, you're sure you know what layers are and how to use them. Uh, continue to, to, to do so with the Creation Kit. There are a few little quirks with it to know about that I'm going to go over right now because I think I want to get those of you who aren't familiar with layers to get in the habit of using them because they're very, very powerful. So one thing to note is that Bethesda does tend to put a lot of their stuff on layers. And uh, you've got a few things going on here. So the name is a unique name. So you if you create a layer, you should name it something unique. The number or the number of items that are on that layer. This V column means uh, is whether or not that layer is hidden, and that is talking about all the items on it. So if you see, if I start clicking on this I, items will start disappearing from my screen there, and that's because all of those items that were on that layer are being hidden. And this is very, very useful. Now the default layer is if no layer is active, which is this A column, then things by default will end up on the default layer. So a lot of Bethesda stuff, they, they failed to put on layers, uh, and so that's all displaying there. But if I, and then you can unhide particular layers. So let's say I want to just turn on the base level. Looks like they called this layer the factory shell, and that's kind of the core of it, even though they, they missed obviously some things that should have been on that layer. Once you've got this down and you're, you can hide all these items, it makes it a lot easier to work with so you can hide a lot of that random clutter and stuff that's happening. And when you're building your own levels or doing your own edits or even editing a space like this, it is a great idea to create your own layer. So for example, you just hit new layer and we're gonna give it a name. Uh, one thing you're going to hear me harking on throughout all of my tutorials is using a prefix. So essentially come up with some prefix that represents you and the mod you're working on and make sure you put it before everything you create. And it just makes it a lot easier with this filtering mechanic in the object window to find all of your items later. So I tend to prefix everything with KG and then whatever the mod is. So we're going to just put this KG 101 since I'm working on the 101 tutorial. And I like to put an underscore after that. So then I can just, once I start creating records, I could come back into this uh, plugin, which we'll, I'll show you how to create in a little bit here. You can just filter on that and then all of the records that I've created will be able to pop up. And we'll, I'll, I'll actually watch, walk you through that in just a moment. So we're going to create a new layer ID. So we've started it with our prefix and then we're just going to call it uh, factory layer. And now you'll see there that it appears at the bottom of the list. Now here's one of the tricky things you should know. And what you're going to want to do is immediately put something on this layer. Now to do that, you're going to want to click on the little A column right there and it doesn't matter if you intend on keeping that thing there long term you just want to put something on the layer so that this layer doesn't disappear because what will happen is if you were to say add another layer or go to a different cell or have to save and load your plugin and or close the creation kit your layer will disappear and it will still exist and then what you end up having to do is hit new layer type in the exact same name and then it'll offer you if you want to use that same layer but if you have an item on it so if i just go ahead and drop this shotgun shell on here now this layer will always be present when I'm loaded into this cell because this layer has something. Now a layer, the same layer name can be used in multiple cells, which is very confusing, but that's what Bethesda opted for. Uh, and sometimes it's useful, but uh, just know that each of your layers should have an absolute unique name because if you try and use the same name again, it is going to try and use that exact same layer. That counts across all cells. For those of you who are getting confused by all this layer talk, you should just get in the habit of if you're going to edit any world space, just hit new layer. And if it, if, if you at least put all of your stuff on one layer, at least you can you can separate it out from all the stuff Bethesda added and it makes it easy. And there's some cool stuff we can do with this later. Uh, I'll just give you a quick example for one. You can right click on the layer and hit select all loaded references in layer. So then you can select all of your items at once. And that's really, really powerful. Um, and you'll see why as we start working or as you start playing around. So that's that's the crux of this particular tool. There are other things you can do with this, and we'll cover those in time. Um, for example, you can filter out the layers. You can move things to layers by selecting them, selecting a layer, and hit Add Selection. We'll cover this in more detail, but just know the layer panel is super powerful for separating items so that you can quickly, especially 
hide them so that you can get to the things you need. Uh, for example, with that F thing, um, let's see if it will if we'll cooperate. So if I pick up my shotgun shell here, we'll put it up in the air a little bit and then push F and see if it works. Yeah, of course it's not gonna work. And I, that also could be that I changed the hotkey on this computer. Uh, but often things like that are really useful if you can, oh no, it did actually move to the floor when I did it, it just took a moment. And that's one of those things where I said the, the F key is, uh, is a little bit wonky, but it's it can be super, super powerful and it can solve a lot of issues with uh with characters not spawning where you want them to again we'll cover this in more detail in the future so that should give you a rough idea of how to use all the base panels and that should give you a lot of information to start playing you should now be able to start editing levels you can start dropping stuff into them deleting stuff out of them obviously there are a lot of there's a lot of issues with doing that i'm sure some of you are thinking what about nav mesh and what about this and previs and all that that's all stuff we'll cover later um don't think about that right now right now and I, I said this in my intro video, your focus should be just making things that, that do stuff. Just get yourself inspired. Just do random things to show yourself how easy it is to get stuff into the game. Because it is really easy. It's really easy to make edits. It's really easy to drop stuff in, to delete things. Just do that and play with it. So, uh, so I think the next thing I need to show you is how do you save your plugin? How do you load your plugin in the game? And how do you reload your plugin in the creation kit when you're ready to come back and work on it again? So let's cover all that now. So after you've made any number of edits, in fact, even before you've made an edit, as soon as you have loaded up something, so once we've loaded up this fallout4.esm, you're eligible to save your plugin. So we're gonna go ahead and hit the save button and you're gonna just type in a name for your plugin and this should automatically by default save into your fallout4 data directory, which is perfect because that will allow you to uh, load it into the game easily. So we're gonna just name this 101 test plugin. You can name yours whatever you want. You don't have to add ESP on there and uh, ESL stuff we'll talk about in another video. We'll cover how you create those. And for now, there's plenty of tutorials I'm sure on YouTube you can find for creating an ESL. And I'm sure a lot of you are interested in that because of uh, you're hitting the plugin limit. But uh, for now, just type in a name and it will by default save it as ESP, which is what most mods should be. And then you'll see at the top there, it will say show the name of your ESP. So now what we're gonna do is uh, you're gonna want to well, I'm going to just show you how to do this. I'm going to close the CK and reopen it just so I can show you how you will load your plugin in the future. All right, so I've relaunched the creation kit. So this will simulate what it's going to be like for you when you are ready to work on your plugin again. So uh, I will use the terms plugin and mod interchangeably. There's very little difference between them. Generally, a plugin is just that ESP file you created, whereas a mod would be the ESP plus any of your extra asset files that all go together. And those come together create the mod, but I'll often use the terms interchangeably. So uh, if you hit file open or click on this little open icon, what you'll find is at the very bottom of the list, if you've just created this, you'll find that your new plugin is there. And after you sort it into your load order, which if you don't know what that means, don't worry about it. But if it's ever not at the very bottom, which this will happen after you've created new mods or installed new mods, essentially these are showing up in ordered list of which they're installed into your game. Um, if it's not at the very bottom, you'll just have to kind of scroll through the list to try and find it. And that's where it's gonna be very important that you come up with a good naming scheme for your mods as well as uh, your actual prefix in the mod where I showed you that thing where I did KG 101. Make sure you name your mods something good so that you can find them later because if you have a lot of mods installed, they're all gonna show up here and it can be, become quite the uh, list. So what you'll do instead of doing fallout4.esm at the top, what instead what you'll do is you'll double click on your plugin and then you're gonna click set as active file. And the active file means that's the one that any changes that are made are gonna get written to. So that's what we want right here. We want it to be on ours. So we're gonna go ahead and hit okay. And just like before, we wait for this to load. And the difference is, is unlike before when we just loaded fallout4.esm for a blank mod, this is going to load our specific plugin so we can continue to make changes to it. All right, now I've loaded into the game because this is gonna be the way that all of you can use to load your plugins. If you have a mod manager such as Vortex, the easiest way to actually make sure your plugin loads is to go to the actual plugins tab of your mod manager and just make sure your plugin is active there. But for those of you who don't know how to do that or don't have a mod manager necessarily, you can all do it this way. And that's you come to the mods screen and you'll have to log into your Bethesda.net account. And then you're gonna click load order. So if you see it down at the bottom of my screen, I've got an Xbox controller plugged in so I can press Y for load order. And then for most of you, you're gonna have to scroll all the way to the bottom there and you'll find your newly created mod. Uh, I went ahead and bumped mine up the load order through another trick, which I'll show you guys another day. 
Uh, but uh, I went ahead and just edited my plugins file because I didn't want to have to scroll all the way to the bottom because I have hundreds of mods installed. Uh, but once you find it in the list, you simply press A to enable it. Make sure it has that check mark next to it. And then you exit out of this screen, exit out of the second screen, and it's going to prompt you asking you to reload your data files. And that's it. And now your mod is active and it should remain active from then on anytime you load your game. So you can enable and disable it from the mods load order screen, even though you don't have actually have it uploaded to Bethesda.net or anywhere else where it might be officially available to others. So that's the easiest way you guys can do it. Uh, the absolute easiest way is probably going to be through your, your mod manager, though, personally in Vortex, which is what I use. You can just go to the plugins tab on the on the left side and find it in there and enable it. So it's very easy to get your mod up and running. All right. And the last thing I promised I would show you guys before we end this exceedingly long video is how to set up auto save so you don't get screwed over by a crash in your uh, creation kit or in your computer. So uh, what you'll do is go to file preferences. And you're going to go to the miscellaneous tab and you're going to check in auto save every and oops i had it on one minute you definitely don't want it on one minute pick a pick a number that's good for you something like 15 i like uh 30 whatever you want to do and hit apply and then close now the auto save doesn't work quite like you think it might you might expect it to just save whatever you're currently working on directly in your plugin it doesn't actually do that instead it creates these back files so if you go into and let's see where i have it here so if you go to uh your steam folder fallout 4 data backup it will create these auto save default back files and essentially what you can do is you can rename these including the extension to the name of your plugin and delete your old plugin or replace it with these and you will have uh, a fresh copy of your of your plugin from the moment that uh, the date is listed there under date modified so uh, i could be wrong about that so if somebody wants to correct me about how the autosave works but that's how i've always used it is if i get a corruption in my file which is i think happened maybe twice ever in all the time of modded so it's not something i'm super concerned with uh, but occasionally due to like lost work from the ck crashing or from a power outage or something like that that's more often where it happens either way what i tend to do is just come in here and grab the latest one rename it to the name of my plugin and replace my active plugin that was uh, not up to date due to, due to a crash of some sort and I'm good to go. So that's all you got to do to set up autosave. And guys, there's going to be tons more to cover. So I know I, I barely scratched the surface of, you know, I didn't touch any of any of these buttons are up here or any of these menus that was intentional. Just want to get you guys the basics so you can start playing around. So, you know, now you can go on the object window here and start digging into these categories. Then you look at the records on the right and double click them to open it, open them and make edits. And you can use the cell window to go into the world and make edits to the actual world by double clicking any of these cells, selecting a different world space if you want to go to cells that aren't listed here. And once you're in the cell, you can move things around, delete them or add things to them by dragging them out of the object window into the world. And there you go. You've got the basics you need to start playing around and editing the game so that you can put something in there. And I'm going to keep reiterating this throughout the series put stuff in the game just whatever because that's how you're going to gain that confidence and the excitement to keep going i'm telling you it's addictive i hardly ever play play games anymore and maybe that's a scary thing for some of you but uh it's for good reason is it's so fun to create games yourself and uh, once you start seeing how easy it is to get your plugins up and running and to make little changes you've always wanted to see in the game um, it's it, you'll get hooked and you're going to want to keep doing it and so just keep driving that to yourself. Just just keep iterating and getting stuff working so that you motivate yourself. And the nice thing about it especially is that if you run into a brick wall later, you know that you have the capability to get certain things working. So you can roll yourself back to that point where you had it working, even if you have to rebuild from scratch to just be like, all right, I had it working here and then just slow down your experimentation and eventually you'll get there. Uh, and we'll cover tons more. We'll get you into more hotkeys. I'll eventually show you how all of the stuff in here works that I know how it works. There are a few things I haven't even touched yet that we probably won't cover but maybe by the time we get to those since this is going to be a weekly series i'll have covered everything in my own uh experimenting with the game and you guys will get to learn along with me so guys i hope you enjoy the series definitely make any recommendations for additional tutorials you'd like to see in the future i have a lot planned already because my focus immediately after the ck 101 is to start covering all of the things in the sim settlements toolkits because a lot of people have already been asking me for video guides to go along with those and i want to get those done first as the uh the sim settlements community has been very very good to me and i want to return the favor with uh 
with these tutorials that everybody's been clamoring for for a long, long time now. And apologies to those of you I promised them long ago and just never got around to them. Uh, they are coming. They'll be coming very, very soon. And for those of you not interested in creating Sim Settlements content, I still highly recommend you go through all of the Sim, Sor Sim Settlement specific tutorials because they're all going to have lessons to teach you general useful things for modding. It will be very rare that a Sim Settlements related tutorial doesn't have you information you can use elsewhere. All right, guys, take care and enjoy the tutorials.